Hi folks, thanks for joining us once again. Um, we appreciate you taking the time to do this. This week's guest is Mr. Graham Lamont. Welcome to you. How are you doing today? On annual leave this week, so it's a good day for doing this. Excellent. And I believe that your uh, your stylist and makeup artist are not around, so you've managed to dress yourself today. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm going to deliver this, this, this talk, but her and Rachel have disappeared out, so I've been left to my own devices as to how I appear. <laughs> I'll probably hear about it later, no doubt. Very good. And um, so you're off this week. Do you get any particular plans, exciting plans? Uh, yeah, in this lockdown, these days, yeah, we're going to be going out to a restaurant every night for a meal and maybe going out, going to France for the weekend or something. But, uh, <laughs> maybe it's like, not. Uh, it's what you call a staycation, but there's one, we've got lots of things lined up to do around the house as ever. And we may, if the weather, if the rain eases off, we, we plan it. We'll meet up with our little grandson for a, a walk anyway at some point during the week. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe come to him a wee bit later on. Um, just to give us a wee bit of an insight into the kind of person that you are, I was going to ask you, what would your ideal day consist of? I know you like planning things and being very organised. What would, um, if you could plan the perfect day, what would it consist of? I quite like, I must admit, I quite like days at home. Lily has been out all morning and I've just, I've been sitting, reading, reading and taking note, writing down little notes and things and just, and that's, I quite enjoy doing that, but if we had a day on our own, yeah, we would we would be up in the hills, still walking. All of the family love it, love that so much. So if we were, and in a free day, we would usually plan a walk somewhere or other. And up in the hills is 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 ideal. So that would probably be our our ideal ideal day. Like on Saturday, we had the most beautiful day up beyond Tlochry, up the Gary and Tunnel Rivers. And it was just, yeah, that's just our idea of a lovely day. That's my that's my idea of an absolutely horrendous day, climbing up a hill. <laughs> well, I believe your sister and my daughter are hill climbing just a few weeks ago, so maybe yeah. it's not... Each, each, to, that. each to their own. I'll, <laughs> I'll stay in and watch the football and get a takeaway. I've been asking everyone, and so I'll ask you as well, which of the interviews that you've seen has maybe been your favourite so far? Everyone's got their own story, haven't they? And it's just been amazing to hear all our diff the fellow believers and how God has worked in their lives from completely different backgrounds. And yet now here we are all together, meeting together in Perth Gospel Hall. And I think that just is further evidence to me of the reality of Christianity, that so many people from so many different backgrounds can be pulled together. But... I've got to say, the one that touched us most of all, and you probably expect this, was was our son-in-law James, and it was just such a thrill to hear James' his story and how, yeah, it had always had been Nicola's mission statement that she went to ABP, and she really had a heart for all the Eastern Europeans that were working ABP, but as it was, she ran into James, who was a good Scottish boy, and his story, so his story was, oh, was really encouraging for us. Yeah. So that's a good good plug for that one. If anyone missed that one, back in series one, you can go back and watch it on uh, YouTube or Facebook or on the website as well. Um, it's well worth a watch. Um, so anyway, let's crack on. Let's learn a wee bit about the life of Lament. So uh, <laughs> firstly, in terms of your childhood, where did it all begin? The great city of Aberdeen. On um, We were living on what, the Bedford Road, which is just up from the Aberdeen University, Aberdeen University, University site. And for my first few years, we were in the top flat of a tenement building in Bedford Road in Aberdeen. You can hardly, you'll hardly believe this, Gareth, but as a wee boy, we didn't have a toilet in, in the flat. It was, a, it was a shared toilet on a half landing in the tenement. You know, that seems absolutely astounding today, but yet that's within my lifetime. So that was... It was quite, I mean, to be fair, it was quite a long time ago, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> the, the years do roll by, don't they? But I've got two young... My, my mum and dad, and I've got two younger brothers, and they're, well, they're all still in Aberdeen. They're all still in Aberdeen. But when I was about oh, six or seven, 
we actually moved up to the, the Cummings Park part of Aberdeen, which is just up from Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. And my mum and dad are still there to this day. And mum and dad were, again, this is something quite different from many of the people you've had interviewed over the over over this series that I am this you know, third or even fourth generation Christian and that my mum and dad were members of a gospel hall in Aberdeen, the Woodside Gospel Hall. And that was where I was brought up. So I was brought up to attend everything as you would as you yeah. would remember from your young. <laughs> yeah. Every, every service that was ongoing, every gospel meeting, every Sunday school for that was my young days but it was a great privilege you know you didn't you never think it at the time but looking back now the privilege of being brought up in that way in a christian home being brought up to know what the bible is all about and to see in your parents the christian life in action it really does make a difference so so as a as a kid when you weren't at the church what um what sort of stuff were you you doing what sort of child were you what were you into as a as a little uh, boy so long ago, it's hard to remember, as you know. <laughs> I do remember, I was just sports mad. Anything with a ball, I was involved in. The football was my craze. And so I remember from where our house was, there's a big, what they call the green, just really, just a little bit away from us, a huge area of green grass. And every spare minute, we would be out kicking a ball around on on the green but it was anything with a ball you might not believe it but I actually played rugby I'll be no surprise I played on the wing that was I was going to ask did did they use you as the ball or something get the ball and run as fast as you could that was my that was my role I played hockey for the school I played table tennis for the school that was all yeah so yeah that was me I was sports I was sports staff that was my childhood you got on well with your your brothers. Uh, well, at times I think we, I, yeah, I think we we had our we had our moments. I think I'm sure my mum and dad will be watching this, so I better <laughs> not paint things too, too rosy. But yeah, we got on. We got on okay. And the the church, as you mentioned, it featured quite heavily um, for you as a youngster. Um, and it was it was Woodside Gospel Hall that you you went to. Um, so what what is your sort of memories of going you said were you maybe a kind of slightly reluctant attendee in those early days no i wouldn't have said so because it's like so many other things i think you're it was just normal you know that was what that was what you did you know in those in, in the days when i was growing up you know things were really was were quite were quite strict in that as Christian families, you know, you did not go out on a Sunday to play football. So that, that I found hard at times when my pals from along would come and say, you're coming out, and it was a Sunday, and say, oh, no, we're not, we don't come out, we're not coming out today. But other than that, it was, you know, I think it was just, this is, this is what we do. So it was the Sundays, I think, was the times you found it hardest when, yeah, you didn't go out, you went to meetings rather than playing football yeah yeah I remember I remember that feeling well um and so what what age were you when you actually became a Christian then I was t- I was a uh, age of 12 and it's it had been building for years now and what really really challenged me as a child was like many people think of my generation was the coming of the Lord you know we constantly heard in those days more so than I think we do today was that Jesus was coming again and he was coming for those who believed in him and they would just be taken, snatched to heaven and those who were not believers would not be going in. From from the smallest age, I remember that being almost a terror to me and I remember creeping through to mum and dad's bedrooms in the night just to make sure that they they were still there. I remember one time in particular, I must have been about six, when my youngest brother was being born and we were staying with uncle and, uh, an uncle and aunt, my other brother and myself, and one night waking up in a strange bed in a strange room and I really, I, I remember yet the absolute terror that the Lord Jesus had come 
everybody had gone and I'd been and I'd been left. And so that played and and then at the age of twelve it was a Sunday eve it was a Sunday, it was in a June a June Sunday evening. And that Sunday, June the fourth, nineteen seventy two to be exact. A long time ago. I, it's just that was eleven years before I was born. Just, yeah, no, uh, that's my first flight thing, isn't it? Yeah, I, that was an, one of my friend, another of my another of my friends I had heard had become a Christian, and that was just yeah, that was just in that night, and that I remember it in the the back seat of the family car in the car park after the gospel meeting, I gave my life to the Lord Jesus. It was very friendly with you might you know Willie Harrison from Aberdeen, yeah. And Willie was in the same gospel, William was in the same gospel hall as I was, as was his two sisters and his mum and dad. And so he was a great guy. So he was a good influence. So we spent a lot of time together. And he was also a football daft. So, and <laughs> with this, yeah. Very good. Um, and so you got a wee bit older, leave school. Um, did you have a part-time job or anything when you were at school? I worked in, the, in what was then... The, the cooperative, the cope, it was a big department store in those days. And I remember I worked in the the, the shoe department <laughs> selling, selling shoes. And it was amazing, you know, these people would come in. And I still remember there was one guy in particular, here's me, a little Saturday boy, what do I really know? And he came in and he asked, you know, he was wanting a pair of shoes. And he ended up buying, going away with five pairs of shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I, was the hero, I was the hero in the, of the day in the in the coat, and I thought, gosh, what do I know? What do I know about this? This man bought five pairs of shoes from from me. So that's that was what I did for Saturdays for a few bit of extra right. extra money. Yeah. And when you finished school, you went off to to study at university. Yeah, went off to university. Yeah, that was. And in fifth year, I was medicine was what I was. That was my plan. I was going to be a doctor. And then as I went into the sixth year, a number of my Christian friends were studying medicine, but then quite a number of them were actually looking, studying pharmacy. And over that year, I began, I sort of changed and thought, no, I'm going to do pharmacy. I hate, I hate to say it, but I think part of the reason was it gave me an easier sixth year. What I required to go in for pharmacy was was less than the, the, what I was actually going to need to get into into medicine. And looking back, I, I, you, know, you can just see God's guiding all the way through your life as you look back. And looking back now, you can say with the psalmist, you know, the Lord has done great things for me, whereof I am glad. And that is clearly was now. It was God that was actually working that led me that led me that way. And so. Yeah. I went off to university, yeah, and I, I, like I said before we started, I do want to impress, you know, I could have gone any anyway at that time. Going off to university or college, as Robert Gordon's was in those days, there's so much opens up to you. And as a young Christian, suddenly, who's never experienced anything, suddenly the world opens, opens up to you at university. And I doubt you definitely was. You could have gone anyway, but I can never ever thank God enough for the nucleus of young Christian friends that I was brought into contact with at university. And they were these were these were strong, committed, enthusiastic, devoted Christians. And I somehow got into their company and for four years, perhaps five years. It was just absolutely wonderful, and yeah, I've got so much to thank them for. I and mean, most of them have gone on so, so, so great. And the very first day, first lecture at the pharmacy, Robert Gordon's went in, sat down, didn't know anybody. The guy came and sat beside me. It turned out that this was Chris Nicholson, who's who was from uh, the Gospel Hall in Kirkwall, in Orkney, and Chris became my best friend for for years and he's now actually director of pharmacy for the Northern Isles and there was a, there was a, a sister and brother Ian Neely who you may know he's active in a Christian church down in uh, the Newcastle area and his sister Elspeth 
who was a pharmacist working in Aberdeen Royal, and they had a flat in Wallfield Place. And for four years, I think I lived in that flat. That is just so vitally important, getting the right, the right friends. The Bible says bad company corrupts good manners. And it is true. Your friends will influence the peer pressure will be immense. Oh, that's a little sorry that's a little sermon rather than an answer to it <laughs> it's okay we expect that from you Graham it's fine <laughs> <laughs> and so when you when you finished up there did you I'm, I'm trying to get from there to when you moved to Perth so there was there a was there a, a few years in between that or did you move straight down to Perth or how did it all come the, the pre-registration year in Aberdeen finished and then we were looking for posts as fully qualified and registered you know, pharmacist and hostel pharmacy was definitely was my that was my thing that was what I wanted to do so we're looking for junior posts and I was staying in Aberdeen that was no doubt about it nowhere else I wanted to go that was where I was going to be and the no post came up and so it was getting nearer to August when we they put it when my pre-registration year ran out and there was a post in Bridgetville, Perth, actually Bridget Bridgetville Hospital. But I did not want to go. And I went, I put in, I got, I applied for the post. I was interviewed and I was offered the job. And it was just, it was awful because it was just the last thing I wanted to do was to leave Aberdeen. And I remember many an evening down Aberdeen Beach, walking along the Aberdeen Beach, you're probably saying debating, arguing with God as to what, why I was being moved from Aberdeen, which is where I just always anticipated that that would be my home for for life. And yeah, it's not the sort of thing you're meant to say, but I remember you know making a deal, almost a deal with God. You know that if I was to move, as He seemed to be leading, then. God would have to provide a wife, a, a, a companionship, companion for me if I moved. And I said, I know that's not the sort of things you're meant to do, but I do remember that's that was the truth of it. Might need to try that one. <laughs> <laughs> so I set up a birth in August 1983, and I arrived just a few weeks after the very, very first Bible study week, which was had died by David Newell. And so Perth was absolutely buzzing. The Gospel Hall, that is, was just buzzing at that time. The, the Bible Study Week had made such an impression on everybody. And at that time, it was full of young, there were so many young folk from that when I moved to Perth. Yeah. So it was a good a good environment to move into in terms of people around about your age and so on. And not only that, and again, I've said this often before, but as God was so good through university and, you know, I can never thank him enough for these young Christian friends and I when we moved to Perth the kindness of the believers was just remarkable you know and you won't remember Annie Ravy but Annie and Willie used to live in that big house up in up in Craigie at Murrayfield House and Annie was just such oh she was just such a gem and there was no any time day or night you could go and Annie would just have the table spread and so we spent many, Lillian and I, we both spent many a Wednesday evenings there after after the meeting and Sunday lunches. And then John and Anna Campbell, they used to stay in Priory Place. And again, that became, when Annie, Annie took, became ill with cancer. And so John and Anna, for many years, that home became our second home. That you just pop in and the five, the five girls, the older ones were... About our age, Audrey was a bit was a bit younger, and yeah, I suppose Moira was as well. But Moira was part of the the group, and it was great. It was just any time we could pop in, we would drop in, and Anna would never blink an eye. She was just always seemed delighted to see you, and just think, wow. And, and then we'd call them and Katie and Raymond and Hannah. You want? Do you remember Bill and Margaret Sutherland? Those early years in Perth, where we were looked after so much. You've, um, you've mentioned her once or twice already, so we'll, we'll speak a wee bit about uh, Lillian, um, who you've been married to for quite a long time now, 
and you've got two daughters and a grandson as well. Um, first question, um, Lillian is originally from Shetland, so how did you actually come to meet? Lillian was in a little gap in her training and they, they offered her a placement at Murray Royal Hospital in Perth for five months. There was a, a catering manager who was, yeah, it was, it was a gap there. So Lillian was offered this. So again, like me, Perth was probably one of the last places on earth she wanted, she was thinking of going to. We vaguely were aware of each other. As I said, one of Chris Nicholson, who was my best friend, ended it through university years, married Martha, that was Chris, Lillian's cousin. And so before Lillian came, Martha had told me, oh, my cousin's coming to Perth. And so before I ever really had met or knew Lillian, in my mind, I thought, I have prayed to God, you know, you go, you go and said, is this God's answer? And so within two months, by Christmas time that year, we were a definite item, if that's the right, still the, still the phrase that people use, we were a definite couple. And so that was just, yeah. It was amazing looking back, seeing God's hand in our lives and what he, what he had done. So, the, so, so the, the first question was, how did you meet her? And the, the second question, which everybody really wants to know, is how on earth did you manage to persuade her to marry you? <laughs> yeah, she, yeah, she's the absolutely great, or she's absolutely great, as you know. So we were married in Shetland in Scalloway Gospel Hall, and Mr John Campbell married us. And yeah, it was a lovely, it was a lovely time. And then, yeah, we were back in Perth at a little flat along in Glover Street. We made the stupid mistake when we went on honeymoon. We went to Malta on honeymoon, and we left the keys to our flat with the Campbell girls to look after. <sighs> Bad move. When we came back, the rest of flat had been. Yeah, I was basically trash. So that's not right. But it was decorated like you would never believe. You can never believe, and so it was such a great welcome back. They must have spent ages, Audrey and her sisters, doing our flat flat up for our return home. So, how many how many years is that you've been married now? Then, uh, well, it was 1980, 29th of March, nineteen eighty six. So, must be what for. Oh. 34, yeah, 34 maybe with a baby. Oh, Lillian doesn't look old enough to have been married that long. She must be quite a bit younger than you. <laughs> You're almost <laughs> the same age, would you believe? I am older, but only by, about, only by a year, yeah. You and Lillian have obviously been involved in lots of different activities of the church over the years. Is there any particular activities that you've been involved in that stand out as maybe kind of favourite things that you've you've done? What I really haven't did enjoy was the years I was involved in Bible class and that I just felt was yeah, something that I was being led to do and it sort of fitted into it, being able to share Bible teaching with with young with young believers and it was really enjoyable for myself as well to actually do the studying for these different subjects and be able to present and share things with the with the young, with the young people, which is what, as I said, Lily and I always had this dream that we would be able to, as others had been to us, to be that support and encouragement. So I really did enjoy these years as Bible class. In recent years, Lily and I have had a lot to do with the Bible study week, and that has just been such a benefit to us over over all those all those years, and a benefit to others. So to be able to be involved and actually organising and running it has just been so thrilling to be able to try and put together something that will be of help and of benefit to other believers and help them on their Christian way, on their Christian pathway. So. Yeah. Lots lots of rotas to be made up for that week as well, so you'll be in your, in your element there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But the whole family is the same. Rachel, Rachel, would be, Rachel would be the same. There's always lists lying around. Of, Rachel is a list person and yeah, I'm a road, yeah, I like organisation and I like planning. I like to know what I'm doing. So yeah. At the moment, you are one of the the elders in the the church. We've we've also interviewed in the past uh, Adrian and Raymond, who are the other elders just now. Um, how long is it you you've been an elder for? When when did you become one? 1998, and that's when I was. I can remember it yet. 
I was in the old South Street stacking up those orange chairs like we used to have to do in South Street all the time, turning the hall around this way and that way. And I remember Herbert Brooks approaching me while I was stacking chairs and asking if I had any thoughts or interests in being an elder. So when Herbert said that, it had been in, in our minds anyway that one day that may be what we where we would go, where our gifts and leading with where our gift maybe was seeking to lead and guide believers to help them and to live to seek to lead the church for the glory of the glory of God is what we look to do. You you must you you would have been relatively young at that point, I, I guess. Well, was that I mean, 32 years ago, so I think I would have been about 15, was I, at that time? <laughs> <laughs> I, would have been in my first, I would have been in my first days. Is there anything that you would say, maybe not necessarily going into specific uh, events or things that have happened, but is, is there anything you'd say is the best thing about being an elder and maybe the, the most difficult aspect of it as well? And I can remember, yeah, several issues over, over all those years where many late night meetings trying to talk through issues and how you put the best way ahead. So these are always, these are very difficult when you always want unity, that the church moving forward together, because we know quite clearly from the Bible and from common sense and looking at the world that if there's not unity, then that's when things tend to fall apart. And so these have been, these have been, some of the really hard times. The other time that's really, really difficult and, and quite dis sad and heartbreaking is when you see people making poor choices and decisions and not wanting to have support or guidance, not willing to listen to what they're being told. And you can just, you know that the choices they are making will lead to lead to disaster but they don't listen and that again can be incredibly hard and difficult but on the other side it is it is always great to be able to see people developing to be able to encourage to be able to encourage others to see them see people living for God and at times when the fellowship is is sweet, you know, people are, are united, working together, that it is for the glory of God. And you do see the benefit of that spilling out into the surrounding community. You know, like it says of Joseph, his branches ran over the wall and that's what we're aiming for as elders and as, as, a, as, Christi as all Christians to actually seek to move forward together, that all the glory is God's and that's that blessing that we know is spilling out over into the communities around us. Yeah. No, it's a, it must be a, a really difficult work. Um, I was going to ask you, did you did you still have hair when you first became an elder? <laughs> I really did. You know, I know my, my dad, when you see his wedding picture photographs, my dad had lost most of his hair by the time he was married. So I... You had no chance. Yeah, I had no chance. I can't remember if I was still here in 1998 or not, but I know quite early on I was losing. And then eventually, I can't remember again when it was, this was like, oh, this is all pointless. You know the way you try and comb your hair and set ways. <laughs> eventually, I decided, oh, what's the point here? We'll just go with this style. So this has been my hairstyle for, yeah, 20 years maybe. <laughs> um, and in amongst all the chaos of... 2020, you also became a grandfather for the first time. <laughs> um, what's that been like other than making you feel even older? It has been great. It's just seeing that, seeing a baby again, you forget how quickly they, they grow and change. And the psalmist says, as you know, no, fearfully and wonderfully made. And yeah, you can, in a little baby, you can just, you can see that. And um, do you think he looks like you, apart from the, the hairstyle? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not used to, I'm not used to those things, but a few people have said they can see he looks like his dad. He, can look, he looks a bit like his dad, but 
I can't quite see it, but <laughs> they all look the same to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, let's um, let's move on um, as we come towards close. Just a few more general questions. Um, we always try and round off with. First of all, have you got a favourite Bible verse? There's a number that have been with me with us for a long time. The verse that a number of people I know have already quoted, and it's the verse above our bed, stenciled on the wall. Jeremiah 29, verse 11 from the New International Version. And I just think it does describe Lily and I's experience. For I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And that I just feel is, epitomizes what our life has been. Another verse, a verse we had at our, at our wedding was our key wedding verse was from Psalm 34 and verse 3. And we're not the first married couple to have this verse. It says this, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. The verse from First Kings 18 has been with me for the last wee while. How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. And really has been a challenge to me. If the Lord be God, follow him. If I really believe that God is God, creator, eternal, why on earth is my life not even more devoted? But the verse I've decided to, to leave with, to, to say is my favourite one so again. You, you've given us three already, Graham. Yeah. <laughs> this, this, is the lead up. this is the one. It's Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. And again, I remember from my Aberdeen days, there was an evangelist called Robert Walker. He always used to say, if you're in a fix, Philippians 4 and 6. And Philippians 4 and 6 says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So that has been a verse that's been special over the years, as the whole of Philippians chapter 4, four is. So there's four for the price of one. It's definitely the longest answer to that question. <laughs> what about, um, have you got any particular Christian heroes? Yeah, I've said Jim Elliot, like many people would, would be, Jim, is reading his story that he was just some amazing young man and his wife as well, Elizabeth Elliot. Uh, for those who don't know, Jim Elliot was a young American Christian and in the 1950s, he went to Ecuador in uh, at South America, and he was martyred by the Indian tribe that he was seeking to reach with the gospel. But he was just some amazing young man. In fact, he got a quote I had written down before we started here that said this, Forgive me for being so ordinary while claiming to know such an extraordinary God. And that was what Jim Elliot said, and that's really what I would say to you today. I have lived an ordinary life, but that is what God wants most of us to do. We're not all called like, like Gareth is, to, like you are, to be an evangelist, to be out there in the forefront. Most of us are called to be, to live ordinary lives at our good friend Stephen Grant has written a little book called that, An Ordinary Christian Life. And it's taken from First Thessalonians chapter 4. And Paul says, aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands so that you may walk properly before outsiders. And for many of us, that's what we are asked to do. Don't kick yourself about because you're not a Jim Elliot or you're not able to do what you do, Gareth. Yeah, most of us are expected to live that ordinary life, living for God, going through all the circumstances and, and all the situations that everybody else does. 
but living that living through these circumstances, knowing an extraordinary God and seeking to show the Christian life through it all. Yeah. Well, I would I would say my life's fairly ordinary as well, to be honest with you. But um, there's a wee plug for Stephen's book as well. It's well worth a, a read if you can get your hands on it. Um, okay. What would you say? What would you say is the best thing about being a Christian? I think, uh, yeah, it is probably that claiming to know an extraordinary God. So it's living a life in relationship with God, the God who is extraordinary, the God who is, it's a word that Christians use, transcendent, a God that is above and beyond and out with anything and everything we can imagine, a God who is outside his creation all-powerful, all-knowing, a God who is everywhere all of the time. And yet, I have the opportunity to live day by day knowing such a God. And although we fail regularly, and I've said before, I often disappoint myself, never mind disappoint the God of heaven. But God is always there forgiving, and always picks you up and sets you on the way again. So that is amazing. And as I've said already, Gareth, looking back now from my advanced age, as you were indicating, and seeing God's hand in the circumstances and the situations and the coincidence, what appears as coincidences in life, and actually to see how God has been leading and moulding and guiding throughout these years. Well, um, thanks very much for sharing your story with us today, Graham. Really appreciate you taking the time to do that. I hope that you enjoy the rest of your week off. Hope you manage to relax and climb some hills or whatever it is that you're gonna do. Um, thanks to everyone at home as well for watching once again, and uh, we'll see you next time. But for now, goodbye and God bless. Mm -hmm.